So my name's Hammond Terry. I'm in the psychology department. Uh, I'm also a member of the Arts Research and Scholarship Committee. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Semiamu, Katsi, Kikwetlam, Kekwat, Suwasan and Kwantlen peoples. Uh, we're grateful uh, to the speakers and all of you for taking time to attend today's presentation. It's entitled Speaking Up, an Inclusive and Equitable Scholarly Presentation Pedagogy with Dr. Craig Stensrud and Dr. Mobley Luger. Um, Craig is from KPU and Mobley is from UBC. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we at Kwantlen Polytechnic University respectfully acknowledge that we live, work and study in a region that overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral First Nations territories of the Musqueam, Ketsi, Semiamu, Sawasan, Kekwat, Kwikwetlam, and within the lands of the Kwantlen First Nation, which gifted its name to this university. In the course of reconciliation, we recognize our commitment to address and reduce ongoing systemic colonialism, oppression and racism that indigenous peoples continue to experience. I hope we hope you will attend and register for the whole series in case you haven't already. Um, you'll get an email with an invitation. Uh, please take a moment to register if you haven't so you can get all the information for the entire series in your inbox. Uh, the next presentation will be on Tuesday, January 30th from 12 to 1 p.m. online again. Uh, the speaker is Ying Ma from the Faculty of Educational Studies at KPU, and the talk focuses on Gadamerian hermeneutics and Confucian interpretation of pedagogical exploration of teaching, which might perhaps have some links to today's talk as well. Uh, a few points of housekeeping before we begin. Please place yourselves on mute, uh, mute throughout the presentation and have cameras set off. That can help with bandwidth. The chat function can be used uh, for comments and questions, and there'll be verbal uh, question time at the end as well. Uh, finally, as Pearl's already mentioned, we'll be recording this section and uploading it to the Faculty of Arts YouTube channel for access in future. We'll have time for discussion at the end. It should be about 10 minutes for this, and you're welcome to ask questions using the raise your hand function and or write your questions in the chat. Without further ado, I'll get to our wonderful speakers. We've got Dr. Craig Stensrud. He's an instructor at the Department of English at KPU. He's trained as a scholar of 19th century US literature, and his research focuses on the role of literature in the anti-slavery movement. Along with his co-presenter, Mobili Luger, he's developed uh, the Precedence Archive for Scholarly Speaking, a website you'll hear more about shortly, and they've shared their strategies for making academic oral presentations more equitable in many venues, including a publication in Discourse and Writing and a conference presentation for the International Society of the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Mobley Luger is an assistant professor at teaching at the Department of English Language and Literature at UBC. Her research has generally focused on contemporary American poetry and its relation to crisis and memory. More recently, her scholarship has turned towards pedagogy and has, she has pro, uh, projects on poetry pedagogies as well as pedagogies of scholarly communication and the first year transition. She's articles published in English Studies in Canada, Memory Studies, Tulsa Studies in Women's Literature, Pedagogy, Contemporary Literature and Discourse and Writing. And she also chairs the UBC's Coordinated Arts Programme. So we're very much looking forward to the presentation. Over to you both. Thank you. I'll just share the slides and then uh, can get started. That good. OK, um, so. Thank you, everybody, for coming uh, and hosting me. It's very uh, nice to be here. Um, we are here to share a project that we've been working on together for a few years now, which is a pedagogy project, um, how we can uh, change the way that we teach scholarly speaking to students across disciplines. Um, do you want to do the agenda, Craig? And so our time together, uh, we're doing the introduction now, uh, and then we want to start with a little warm up. We have a jam board where we want to hear from you in terms of what you're thinking about uh, with this topic and what you might be interested to learn in the session. Then we'll present to you for a bit, telling you about what we see as the problems in how um, speaking is taught in the classroom um, and some of the anxieties that students bring to speaking, uh, then we will introduce to you the project that we have really been focused on for the past, past couple of years, which is building a website called The Pass. I think, as was mentioned, the President's Art Precedence 
Sounds like president. The president's <laughs> archive to scholarly speak for scholarly speaking. So we'll show you, give you a little tour of our website, uh, have a little discussion around uh, teaching with precedents, which is something we're really um, focused on and excited about. And then if we have time, we also hope to share with you a brief overview of some of the work we've started on assessment for uh, scholarly speaking. Um, so kind of, uh, setting up uh, some of the new work that we're doing. And then we are very much trying to have 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Just briefly again, uh, yeah, I uh, want to, before we start formally here, acknowledge that at KPU, we work and study in a region that overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral First Nations territories of the Musqueam, Ketsi, Simiamu, Suwasin, Yakite, and Coquitlam with the lands of the Kwantlen First Nation, which has gifted its name to our university. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that much of the research for this project was completed at UBC on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And we also thank, uh, take the, we'll take this moment to thank the Indigenous Initiatives consultants from the UBC Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology for their input on our project. So before we uh, get into sort of where we're coming from, we'd love to hear where you are coming from. And we have made a jam board to uh, collect your uh, questions and thoughts. Uh, I think it is already in the chat, um, but we, if anyone cannot see it, we can put it in the chat again. Um, and we'll just give you a couple of minutes. If you're not familiar with Jamboard, uh, you you can go to the left side of the page and create and use a sticky note or a text box to write your message right on the board. And I think Craig's sharing it there so we can watch it populate. And I think a few of you have found it. Um, so yeah, we would just love to hear uh, sort of what you what you came hoping to learn or what challenges you face um, in uh, in deliver in, in assessing oral presentations, creating assignments. Uh, I understand there might be students in the room. So if you're a student, then, you know, what are some things that you uh, face as challenges when you're assigned an oral presentation? Um, these are things that are actually really, really interesting to us as our project sort of expands and grows. Um, and we change the world uh, <laughs> one <laughs> one workshop at a time uh, in terms of uh, of how we approach sort of the academic culture uh, uh, and um, and pedagogies around scholarly speaking. So I just popped the link in again in case anyone is having trouble. If anyone's trying to open the link and it's not quite working for them, is it possible for them to just verbally give a response and Craig, you could type it in? Is that possible or no? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And you can also use the chat, and we can uh, we can take uh, comments from the chat as well. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. We've got a couple of great comments here. Someone already, as I said, they want to learn how to speak in a way that goes beyond academic jargon to reach a broader audience. I think that's a big focus for us: is kind of thinking about audience. So, preparing our students to know what's specific about reaching an academic audience, but more broadly, uh, encouraging them to think about who they're talking to and how that should affect how they're sharing information. Rubrics, yeah, in the assessment part, we'll also discuss uh, some rubrics we've been toying with, some ungrading strategies, uh, yeah, and, and just kind of ways we've been trying to rethink some of the rubrics we've seen out there that are a bit problematic. Sorry, uh, Outlook keeps reminding me every two seconds about this meeting, uh, this very one that we're currently in. So I'm trying to dismiss that and silence it, but yeah. Yeah, and I think this this next comment about thinking outside the box in terms of genre and creativity is uh, really interesting. It's something hopefully we can have some time to talk about in the discussion period as you're going to learn soon. A lot of what we're trying to do is introduce the students to what's expected at the university, what are some of the norms of university present presenting. Uh, but one of the kind of overarching questions we've had is, OK, once they know that have that knowledge, 
how can we kind of push against it, improve upon the kind of norms and find ways to make things, I guess, yeah, more creative and off and more enjoyable for the audience, more meaningful for the audience. You Another really, great, yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, Craig. Yeah. Oh, I just saw this one about how uh, how to keep students on track. That's something we're really interested in too. Is thinking about uh, oral presentations as a part of a larger process, so not just kind of expecting students to show up, give their presentation, uh, and then return to their written work, but kind of integrating them so it's a larger part of the course and our curriculum more broadly. Yeah, and I think that really speaks to, I really like that, you know, the, how you can make it meaningful. One of the things that really brought us to this topic was that sense of, um, well, sort of misery <laughs> that can come from all parties when students are giving presentations. The students are anxious, the audience is uncomfortable and bored. Um, so I think that's a really wonderful goal is to, is to figure out how to make it meaningful. Um, and I and I also appreciate uh, the, the language in the comment, you know, creating an inclusive performance environment that is respectful of linguistic and cultural difference. You sort of hit on the head some of the language we're going to use in the presentation where we want to rethink, you you know, this very idea of performance uh, in order to create that equity um, for students who uh, have linguistics and, and cultural differences. So that's really at the heart of, of what we're doing. And hopefully that does help students become more comfortable, which addresses that other yellow sticky at the mm -hmm. bottom. Uh, and then also just kind of that, that the meaning, the goal of, uh, of things being meaningful. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so maybe we'll go back to the presentation and uh, really thank you for sort of helping us see your the stakes that you have. Um, and I do think we'll we'll cover some. And, and if there's things that we haven't directly addressed, then that's certainly something we can talk about uh, in the at the end. Um, but uh, I will just sort of launch into uh, uh, sort of a frame for this project that how we came to the project and how we are rethinking um, scholarly speaking. A lot of the same questions and concerns and goals that you're sharing in in the chat there, or sorry, in the in the Jamboard. Um, and I'll just sort of say like the very for, for the project started with an observation that I had about five years ago. Um, and then sort of sat on for a while until Craig and I really brought things together in earnest about three years ago. But um, the work started when I was organizing a student conference in the program that I teach in at UBC, which is a cohort program for first year students in the Faculty of Arts. And that's a picture on the slide of, of our student conference that we have every year. Um, every year in March, we organize this conference and the presentations are always phenomenal. Um, and at the same time, sometimes in the same week, uh, of attending the, the conference with these phenomenal presentations, I would sit in my classes where I had assigned student presentations and they were, you know, as I was just saying a minute ago, stressful, awkward sort of exercises in misery. And I was trying to understand what the differences were between those two environments. And of course, you know, in some sense, and on the one hand, the difference is, is self-selection. So you have students who are self-selecting to participate in the, the conference. But I think it's more than that. And it seemed to have to do with um, the situation of the conference. So um, the way that there was a sort of community built among the presenters. So they attended a workshop before the conference on sort of what to expect in uh, in a conference setting. We had offered them a proposal writing uh, workshop before that. Um, they really came to see the, under, the, they came to see the situation of an academic conference as part of research sharing um, and learning and giving. And it really wasn't the same as the situation of the scholarly uh, or sort of the classroom context, which was just sort of this segmented and now you're gonna share your work orally and I'm gonna grade you and we're all gonna sit here. Um, so I started to think about how I could help students in my classroom gain the sort of conference-like experience. And I also at that point did a really early focus group with some of my students. Um, and they told me things like this. Next slide, please. Um, they said, you know, we're not taught that it shouldn't be nerve wracking. Uh, we know when we're when we're taught to give a presentation, uh, there was a lot of focus in the conversation around the audience. So they said some people are really disrespectful. They don't even pretend to listen. And there was this desire to discuss uh, from these students. They said, you know, we want to discuss how the audience is supposed to react, what the protocol is for the audience. And one student said, it's like when you go to the theater, you know, you can't be noisy, you can't be eating, um, and 
I see two things in these answers. So one of them is a desire to understand and participate in a, in a genre, right? In a, in a in a setting that everybody understands the rules and the protocols of um, and what the expectations are for the speaker and for the listener, something that we don't always have in the classroom. Um, and then of course, the other theme here is just one about anxiety. Um, and that's also, that's, that's a big, so those two ideas, um, understanding uh, speaking within a, uh, a setting of like academic values and academic protocols and responding to uh, student anxiety. Those are the two drivers that have really motivated this project that we've been working on. And, you know, I think we'd all be familiar with certainly the anxiety piece. Do you want to go to the next uh, slide, Craig? Uh, so, you know, there's tons of studies on uh, how presentation anxiety interferes with learning. 61% of students rank fear of public speaking as the top three source of anxiety. 80% of students report that oral presentations were a source of anxiety impacting on learning and well-being. Um, and we've in, we're going to tell you a little bit more about this website that we built and some of the analysis and evaluation that we've done of that. But in some of that evaluation, we asked students about how they've been taught and what what concerns they have around uh, speaking in class and oral presentations. Um, and we came to see from that uh, study that in fact, you know, it could be the very way that students are taught to give presentations that contributes to their anxiety. Uh, next slide. So we asked students, um, uh, in our survey about their feelings of preparedness. And so that's what you see at the top in that graph. So we said, thinking back to how you felt at the beginning of the term, and these are uh, first year students that we surveyed for the most part. Um, there's some exception there, but for the most part. Uh, so we're thinking back to how you felt at the beginning of the term, I felt prepared when asked to give a presentation in class. So uh, if you look at the the bar there it's actually about 75 percent of the students that we studied said yes i do feel prepared i do feel like i know what i'm supposed to do um and when we ask them you know share with us this is the bottom of the slide how you were taught to give an oral presentation they said things like this hand gesture eye contact and appearance are important be confident body language uh, one had to be confident speak clearly and in an authoritative tone and generally act like they know perfectly well about what they're doing <laughs> uh, and so we were we we're sort of surprised that students felt prepared and yet also nervous but looking over the data we came to see that's perhaps the way that they're being prepared the things that they're being told are important some of the things you see on the slide is that is what making is what making them nervous um and you know you can see evidence for the way that speaking is taught in not just in student responses, but in looking at these resources. Next slide. So on the left, you see like the endless supply of YouTube videos that tell you how to deliver a presentation in five tips. And on the right, you see a resource from UBC Library, which prioritizes things like body language, eye contact, distracting behaviors, and clear speaking uh, when preparing students to give presentations in class. There's also an example from a textbook that we found. Next slide. You know, curb your accent is what it says on the bottom there. Uh, you know, don't dress in a dodgy way. So what we see in these these tips that students are learning and sort of from a variety of different places um, is the ways that our dominant approaches to speaking place value on the performance aspect or the delivery. So values that uh, have to do with how they look and sound when they're presenting and are less about what they're communicating when they're presenting. And these are values that we fear uh, create anxiety and, and moreover sort of beyond anxiety and where our real intervention lies is around the, the inequities that are produced. So the way that these will privilege a certain kind of speaking and a certain kind of speaker. Um, next slide, I think. Yeah, so some of the, we, we found a vocabulary for this problem with the work of uh, Michael T. Motley, who gave us this language around the performance and communication continuum. And Motley uh, suggests that if you can, uh, he his, his investment is in uh, public speaking anxiety. Uh, and he is uh, talking about how if people understand uh, presentation or public speaking as a performance, they will be more anxious than if they understand it as a form of communication. So you can see on the performance end, we have a set of attitudes and beliefs that make public speaking analogous to the performance of Olympic figure skaters and concert pianists. 
where the audience is sort of judging your every move as they would be if you, you know, fell when you were skating, you would lose a, a point um, versus the communication uh, paradigm, which is where the objective is to share information and the audience is actually responding to your message, not judging you. Um, and so this, this for us really fit with the academic uh, situation where, you know, if you make a small mistake, like, you mess up your slides, you stumble on your words. This is not, you're going to lose it. You shouldn't lose a point. The, the, the real objective is to communicate and reach your audience with your ideas. Um, and like I said, our, our interest in this continuum goes beyond anxiety and connects to our sense that their performance orientation often uh, reinforces prejudices, rewarding students who speak English without an accent, for example, or look a certain way. Um, and, you know, we think about the students who are in our classes, uh, diverse uh, backgrounds, diverse language abilities, different accents, different ways of speaking, trained in different academic and presentation settings and cultures. Um, and this is where our concerns about equity come into focus. And I'm just going to share some research uh, quickly, uh, brief examples of research that we've come to in some in an article uh, research we cite I should say in an article that we published in 2022 and you can see some quotes on the slide on the left is the citation and I'll just sort of briefly review I think maybe in some sense we, we know this to be true in our hearts but you know the performance orientation can be linked to what writing scholars have called profoundly exclusionary pedagogies uh, in which students are judged for being deficient in ways beyond their control so there's a real analog to this work in writing studies which is really pushing back against you know standard um, language and, and grammar checking uh, that's kind of the performance of writing, right? Uh, for example, classmates and instructors may be steeped in what Asao Inoue calls white racial habitus and so find students with accented English simply not to be speaking clearly. We, we bring these white habits of judgment, Inoue says, that we cannot fully see or hear or feel, but that we use to judge uh, those who are reading or listening to. Uh, the linguist Rosina Lippi Green argues that the variety of English a person speaks, highly regarded or stigmatized, standard like, or vernacular cannot predict the effectiveness and quality of an utterance, but what can be predicted is that people will be judged based on the language markers that they're using. Um, and we've also looked at not only uh, inequities among uh, sort of speaking and, and, and speaking clearly, but also around neurodiversity. Um, so we have certain, um, so there's certain academic values. This comes from the uh, disability scholar Margaret Price around making eye contact, uh, being appearing collegial in a certain way, connecting with our audience, and uh, we this these values could could undermine the presentations of new neurodiverse students who may not. Uh, exhibit those behaviors. So, for instance, for whom making eye contact uh, is 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 unachievable. Uh, we you know we look, talked uh, sort of someone who has uh, some kinds of tics um, that you know those behaviors, those those um, those gestures that we're being told to curb, etc. So, you know, in other words, we've really come to see that the way we teach. Uh, in textbooks, in websites, in our in our classrooms, in our tacit expectations, reinforce the performance paradigm, and that the so and that the, that paradigm is not only pervasive and not only anxiety producing, but also exclusionary. Okay, over to you, Craig. Right. So, uh, yeah, we're going to share our website here in a moment. We've uh, create it. But first, yeah, I just want to say kind of the thinking behind this was we thought that a part of the way we could address these inequities, address uh, some of these anxieties a student has by what would be by providing them with models, providing them with examples so they can approach this uh, in a way where they see the the examples of, of university presentations and think less about them as performance, but as a communication genre. So here we're really drawing on work uh, done in writing studies that aims to, I guess, bring students up to speed on some of the norms and expectations around university writing. Uh, so we want to reduce anxiety and underline the pedagogical value of our scholarly speaking assessments. Uh, and we think this can start with direct instruction about oral presentations, moving away from this kind of one size fits all uh, skills approach to teaching oral presentations. Uh, instead, getting them to notice, uh, I guess, what's specific about giving an act academic oral presentation, what are the expectations at the university level, much in the same way we will do this in our writing classes by teaching students what we expect 
from their written work at university and how it differs from differs from writing for pleasure, writing for high school, even writing for different audiences. So in the with writing, we have a lot of examples where students or students have a lot of ways to see existing written work already, but this is not as easy to come about for oral presentations. So what we've tried to do then is create this archive of precedents. Uh, these are examples or models that students can access so they get a better uh, introduction to what presenting at the university looks like uh, with less of an emphasis on that performance orientation. So I'm going to quickly give us a tour of the website. Feel free to uh, follow along uh, by going to speaking.arts.ubc.ca. Uh, apologize for the UBC brand in KPU pride over here, uh, but this is, this was great. Well, with Moberly, we were both at UBC. I'm just going to stop sharing here and switch to my web browser. homepage. Right, so to help shift student understanding of the purpose of scholarly presentations, we created this open access web resource, the Precedence Archive for Scholarly Speaking, or the PASS. Uh, so the site is an online archive of video recorded undergraduate scholarly presentations. You can also find there accompanying or curricular supports to help students recognize the central features of academic oral genres. So I'm going to offer this quick guided tour uh, of the site. So once you're on the home page, you can find a bit of an overview of our philosophy that we've already been discussing a bit. But at the heart of the site is the archive itself. So our archive consists of videos of undergraduate presentations from various disciplines. Many of them were done uh, at the CAP conference that Moberly spoke about, but also we've managed to get uh, some different undergraduate conferences, classroom presentations on there, and there's quite a diverse selection of videos now. Uh, so it was important for us that a resource aimed at undergraduate students would feature videos of their peers. Uh, this is important also just because they can see, I guess, a realistic vision of what undergraduate present presenting might look like, what presenting at the university more general might look like. So students make mistakes, they mispronounce words, sometimes they get flustered. But we like the videos for these imperfections, really. They're not always going to be polished professional presentations, but on the whole, the presenters are really able to effectively communicate their ideas, share the research that they're excited about. So we believe that seeing these examples can help shift uh, students away from that emphasis on performance and delivery. Uh, these videos uh, cover the major genres of scholarly speaking. So you can uh, filter here. We've got a filter tool, tool up top. So you can go between conference presentations, roundtable presentations, classroom presentations, poster presentations. You can see full panels. We have a couple examples, some that feature the discussion period. Uh, and there's also uh, the ability to filter by uh, length. So if you're assigned a five minute presentation, you can click there uh, or else by genre and discipline or sorry, by discipline as well. So all the different disciplines we've covered so far. Uh, we're really working to expand that, but we've uh, recently gone beyond the arts and got some STEM presentations up there as well. So while we know that students benefit from examples, uh, we also recognize that simply providing precedent videos without further guidance can have some limitations. So there's always that example when we give our students a model or an example, they're going to treat it as uh, a template that they can just emulate uh, basically by rote. In our archive, however, as you can see, we really want students to interact with a diversity of examples rather than a single model. Uh, and there's also an ability to have a guided entrance into the archive. Switch here to the student guides. Uh, so here again, we're going to borrow from, you might think of as a genre theoretical or writing in the disciplines approach to teaching academic writing. We're really trying to key in on the scholarly rhetorical moves that are specific to different disciplines and different disciplinary genres. Uh, and we think this approach really empowers students to discover their voices as they're learning the, the building blocks of academic discourse. 
So we have these uh, a series here of guides highlighting the essential features of academic discourse with an eye to the specificities of scholarly speaking and scholarly speaking situations. So how do you cite in an oral setting? How do you share your lit review? How do you prepare for the discussion period? These are all covered. Quickly click into one of them here. We'll go to the anticipating audience needs. So these also involve a lot of reflection activities uh, that are really trying to get again students to think not just oh is this so how can I do it but showing multiple examples and saying which one will work best for you given your audience. So for example we have a compilation here uh, that shows how students can forecast where they're headed giving an agenda for the presentation to follow and I'll show a short clip of it here just so you can get a sense of the content on the page. The sound isn't coming through. I, the closed captioning was good, but I don't oh, know. Oh, sorry, the sound to... isn't working. Yeah. I there we go. I will furthermore explore what this means okay. for the future of legal frameworks and gender based violence in this new age of mediatization. Sorry about that. I, I had it turned on earlier. I, I thought it would just stay on. But yeah, so you can see the compilation videos we have there as well. Again, the, the principle here is giving multiple examples so students can really do that reflective work of what will work best for them. Uh, the site also offers one of the latest things we've added are these student reflection videos. So these are theme compilations uh, that we've made. We recorded a number of our presenters uh, from the archive. We recorded interviews with them rather, uh, talking about their experiences with scholarly speaking, uh, and especially the some of the challenges, common challenges of presenting that came up. So talking through nerves, how do you speak with your audience during the Q&A session? So that's kind of an oversight of the, or an overview of the website. I'm gonna stop sharing here and return to the presentation. We do hope you'll have a chance to have a look uh, on your own and hopefully use it in your classrooms if you're teaching or use it for uh, your courses if you're a student. So we've just submitted uh, a paper for review that summarizes our evaluation of the website uh, that we've carried out over the past two years by surveying our students at UBC and KPU. Uh, today I just want to share a few important themes from our findings, what our students are telling us about the site. Uh, so our first year students told us how helpful it was to see a university presentation before having to give one and to learn, as the student says, about the norms, the expectations or conventions of scholarly speaking. Uh, one first, so they also told us the site's approach helped reduce their anxiety about presenting, uh, allowing them to focus on developing the content of their presentations. So framing it as a conversation rather than a performance helped take away a lot of stress associated with perfectionism. And the student, another student followed up to say that this allowed them to develop the content rather than the performance. So we're really hopeful here seeing how these values are, are getting taken up from students that have used the website. That's a lot of information up front, so we thought we'd give a, a, a brief chance here to have a bit of a chat with everybody in the room. Uh, just to talk about uh, using precedence. So we just want to hear from you. How might you use precedence in your teaching or learning? That might mean how could you could you see yourself using the one the type of precedence we have on the website, uh, or else are you already doing so in different ways? Do you have any questions or concerns about using precedence or sharing them with students? And if you have ideas too, we're always interested to hear what are some other ways we can make scholarly speaking more equitable and inclusive. 
again, we'll have some time at the end for a more general Q&A, but I just I think we wanted to take a moment here and just hear your thoughts more directly on, on what we've had to say so far. And again, feel free to pop it in the chat uh, or raise your hand and get on the mic and, and tell us. <clears throat> Dale, hi. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thanks uh, for coming. I do use your website in English 1100 and oh, I play it on the very first day of class to tell students um I play sorry I play a video of students talking to each other having a conversation that Moberly you're um uh, moderating and I just uh, ask students to think about the conversation afterwards and say what kind of moves were those students making and just to help them feel more comfortable about what to expect from classroom discussion that's, that's wonderful so cool to hear yeah Are you about one of the part is it in the q a compilation is that is that what it, it, it what the one you're talking about i'm trying to I'll find it. it and i'll put it in the chat oh that's great that's so interesting Thanks, to hear. yeah and i think that's kind of a, another place we're moving towards we do have quite a bit of uh information on the q a period specifically but we're also starting to think about scholarly speaking beyond presentation culture a little bit so the other ways that students are asked to participate and speak in our classrooms is something we've uh, we've thought about and are, are, are kind of thinking of how we could expand uh, our project to account for some of those as well. And I, I really like, I, I'm going to try, I'm going to use your idea there too. I've not thought about that before to sort of start off with showing that conversation and what a conversation looks like. One of the things that students told us, or one student told us in the uh, you know, Craig mentioned that we interviewed students and there's the reflection videos. And one of the things that one of the students said in there was, it's really cool that I'm the expert and that people are asking me and, and my profs even are asking me the, que the questions about my research. And I think that that's a great quote. Actually, I could find that and share it as well. But uh, it's a great way that the student is framing that idea of themselves as a researcher. And so to start off uh, with that, it, I haven't thought to do that, but you were inspiring me that that would be a really good idea. I can't see the chat mobile relief, but are you oh, uh, monitoring well, that? Is uh, uh, Heather Sear saying that she will use these in the future, which we're excited about, and Dale putting in the link to the video that was just oh, cool. mentioned. Um, so no, no further questions there, unless there are other ones on the way. I, I wonder if you could uh, ask students, give them a rubric that focuses more on the communication paradigm and then ask them to evaluate some of these um, these uh, presentations as well as a way of trying to understand more about how they're going to be evaluated themselves, which might reduce the anxiety a bit more. Yeah, and we were good. that's kind of where I guess uh, there aren't more questions here. I guess I could segue into my uh, the kind of last part of our presentation about assessment, but I do have an assignment that's like that. I'll talk about it briefly, but just uh, just to kind of foreshadow, I guess, uh, look ahead a bit. Uh, yeah, we. I have an assignment where I get students to watch these videos and instead of kind of, I guess, evaluating them objectively with, a, you know, with a rubric, I ask them, how are they meeting the needs of their audience? How might you have to do something different given who your audience is, what your, the composition of your audience for this class? Uh, so getting them to reflect, I guess, less on the objective, you know, check marks of a rubric uh, and more on thinking about what are these students doing? How are they meeting the needs of that audience? Is it going to work for me or will I have to do something different? So that's a great point. Yeah. And I would just I would add also kind of on that idea. I gave a, a workshop to students in the pharmacy um, 
uh, in a pharmacy class at UBC. And what we did in that in that setting with students was I showed them three different videos. And the idea was, again, not to say like what's better or how is this good, uh, but just to, to notice the differences. So three different ways of starting a presentation, uh, three different ways of using citation in a presentation. The, the compilation videos do do that to a certain extent, but I had students look at sort of like the, just the idea that the comparative can be really generative to get away from this idea of uh, you know good and bad versus how, how how is it meeting your expectations? Are you bored? Are you interested? Um, you know, are you are you following along? So really uh, getting them to think about how their needs were met in different ways by the different strategies of the presenter. So just another sort of idea to throw out there for those who um and craig we have someone else saying that they'll use the website uh fabrizio saying that so you know that's one way to use it as well is to play a few videos uh from the archive and sort of conduct your own um comparative conversation but yeah maybe a good time to segue to uh the evaluation element or assessment yeah uh so the past site does feature some teacher resources uh and our newest research has research is also focused on how to shift instructor thinking uh, about uh, about oral presentations, assignments, and assessments uh, away from the performance paradigm. So that's kind of the second major output of our research. It's been so far we've got a series of strategies for oral presentation assessment. This kind of came to us because we're thinking if a student uses our website uh, to prepare the presentation and then they get docked 10% for not making appropriate eye contact with the instructor. They'll not only feel misled by us, uh, but they'll also feel that they've had many of their worst fears about scholarly speaking, about themselves and their abilities as scholarly speakers confirmed. Uh, so many of the existing rubrics we found online and in textbooks and in the scholarship seem to have a strong emphasis on performance aspects so we can see here one that is ranking students based on their eye contact with the audience body language loud clear slow speaking correct pronunciation appearing enthusiastic and confident uh, meaningful and fitting gestures frequent eye contact and so on uh, some of these go so far to say did you use the english language properly uh, so we think these are clearly problematic uh, and I'm going to briefly introduce three interrelated principles for what we think of as a communication oriented oral presentation assessment design. So our first principle encourages discipline and genre specific assessments. Uh, Marianne Huron, your collaborators remind us, oracy involves more than skills. It requires uh, recognition of genre, register, appropriacy, and the diversity of academic speaking contexts. Uh, so writing pedagogy scholarship has taught us that teaching students to recognize, adopt and adapt disciplinary and genre norms can allow them to meet the needs of academic audiences. And we want students to recognize that their oral presentations should similarly be responsive to the needs of a particular audience and show them that there are disciplinary and genre norms that can serve as, we'll say, shortcuts towards effective oral communication. So this approach allows students to recognize the role that presentations play within a broader apprenticeship into academic uh, culture that we think occurs in first year teaching more broadly. So moreover, uh, we find communicating in our assignment descriptions that we are teaching and assessing learnable knowledge rather than what are often seen as innate uh, public speaking skills, that this can help reduce student anxiety. So in our site evaluation data, we found that many students, it was actually 76% of students reported that they, quote, felt less anxious knowing the instructor would evaluate the presentation from a communication orientation rather than judging their performance. The second principle uh, goes on this focus on learnable genre knowledge. Uh, we want to promote a scholarly speaking pedagogy that distributes assessment across the process of gaining and, dis and, and demonstrating disciplinary speaking competence in a course. So here again, we want to reduce student anxiety uh, by taking some of the grading weight off the presentation. In my own class last term, I gave a, I had a research symposium presentation assignment. It's worth 12% of their overall grade, uh, but only 5% of that grade comes from the assessment of the presentation itself. So the assignment I was referring to 
earlier in response to Hammond's question. So students also completed pre and post presentation reflection activities worth 2% each. Uh, so the pre reflection activity was particularly helpful for introducing students to the norms of academic presentation genres, encouraging them to think ahead about how they could anticipate their audience needs. And again, this is uh, based on some uh, research we've done, backed up by research that we've done that tells us that first year students who complete those kinds of uh, pre and post reflection activities get a greater sense of satisfaction and they also experience less fear, indecision and confusion around presenting. That brings me to the third and final uh, principle of oral presentation assessment design. We want to integrate the presentation into students learning about the broader research process. So that's rather than treating the oral presentation as a standalone assessment that's often seen as disconnected from the rest of their often generally writing based coursework. So for professional academics, scholarly presentation, conference papers, for example, are seen as both standalone genres, but also as part of a broader research pro program. We want our undergraduate scholarly speaking pedagogy and assessment to recognize both of those roles. So in our classrooms, we started treating the oral presentation as a chance to share work in pro progress with classmates. So it's an opportunity to formulate ideas in a way that communicates key findings from an ongoing project and receive useful feedback from instructors and peers. Uh, so in my uh, research presentation assignment I just discussed, uh, they share their term paper projects in class before submitting the final version. And they submit a reflect reflection with the term paper explaining how preparing and giving the oral presentation shaped their research and revision process. So to experiment with, or sorry, to embody these three principles, we are experimenting with ungrading uh, practices that emphasize process over product or labor over assessed quality. Uh, as recent scholarship has shown us, traditional grading models often encode prejudicial views that disadvantage our equity seeking students. And we think that this certainly pertains to traditional ways that oral presentations have been graded. Uh, so we're also redesigning our rubrics, attempting to offer formative feedback that addresses not only the information being communicated, but also the presenter's grasp of oral communication strategies taught in the course. So how can they present their research to best allow the audience to understand and evaluate their ideas? And this approach we found can also address seeming performance issues in language that speaks to communication values. So you spoke too quickly becomes as an audience member, I had trouble following the logic connecting the different parts of your thesis statement, for example, slowing down your speech, repeating key ideas, or offering visual support could all help the audience keep up with your ideas. So to conclude, our goal with both the student and the instructor facing uh, elements of this project is, contribute, is to contribute to a broad institutional shift in approaches to speaking pedagogies. We want both faculty and students to reflect on the values they hold for public speaking. We're also keen to find further ways to encourage criticalities around the genres academics speak in. Our aim is to empower students to not only watch how others do it when it comes to scholarly speaking, but also to take informed, critical and creative approaches to their disciplinary presentations. So we hope to facilitate continued conversations that will normalize equitable and alternate non-performance paradigms for scholarly speaking. Starting now with our discussions uh, period, we managed to get here with, to get to the end here with 10 minutes to go, so we'd be happy to answer any questions or hear any comments you might have for us. Thanks. I'm, I'm very proud of us. Look at that, 149. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, what a very interesting uh, presentation. I'm sure there are lots of questions and comments. Feel free to raise your virtual hand or you can type your comments into the uh, chat box. Hi Fabricio. Hi Frank. Hi Robert. Very, very good presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your insight. <clears throat> I I enjoyed especially the, the part about the performance and the paradigm. 
because it aligns with uh, the approach that Paul Freire proposes for education. Uh, proposes education as communication, not as like passing on knowledge from the instructor to the students. And uh, the other piece that uh, struck me was the quotation about uh, grading as a basis practice. Which also, I mean, it's the same approach because communication involves a horizontal relationship between the people involved in their communication, right? And when we grade, we put ourselves in a position of superiority. Um, so, I would be and I, my question for you is, um, what could we do? Because I, I feel like we have this um, constraints by the institution, the, the regulations that um, force us to grade. So um, I know that there have been many efforts to overcome this, but. I think that that could be more, and I would love to be engaged in efforts. So I wonder if you have more uh, insights and thoughts to share with you. Thanks. Yeah, more really do you want to? I think that yeah. So, sorry, Fabricio. I will say we had I had a bit of trouble hearing hearing your microphone at points, but I I think if I if I'm correct, the question probably was kind of okay if we recognize that grading practices as they currently exist are inherently pr problematic. What do we do uh, about that, given that we have an institutional requirement to grade our students? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, the first one I just is just a sort of thought, not an answer related to what you were saying about um, the sort of communication being horizontal. I actually think that class presentations is a really sort of uh, embodied way to understand or try and create that that horizontality because you never had that experience where students are giving presentation like directly to you, right? Uh, and that that's that sort of um, uh, replication of this idea that I'm just sort of submitting this to you for a grade. And if we can create uh, a, a, a class community where they're presenting to their peers, maybe by doing some of the things that uh, was suggested uh, in the previous discussion, sort of framing the class as a conversation. I think that would be one way to really shift that. But anyway, that doesn't answer your question, but it was just sort of something I was thinking about. One, one thing I do um, is um, I, I like I understand that we need to produce grades at the end of the semester. Um, and also, you know, there's some uh, Craig and I were just at the MLA big conference in Philadelphia where people were talking about ungrading and labor based grading and contract grading. And the response always in those conversations is it's always a ton of work uh, to sort of switch your whole grading practice around and then ultimately to have to sort of undo it when at the end you you, you have to produce a, a grade. Uh, UBC, I, I need a number as well, not just a letter. I don't know how it is at KPU. But one of the things I do is I do uh, assignments that are labor-based graded. So uh, like, like or or specification graded as, as Craig had on the slide there. So it's not the whole semester, but in, in this assignment, it's worth five points and you can win these points by doing these five bits of labor. Um, uh, and so I'm not evaluating the quality of any of those things, but you are a, sort of a point system that you're earning. And I wouldn't do that in an essay necessarily or like in all of my assignments, but I would do it in a, in a certain segment of assignments and it could be done in a presentation assignment in order to show students again that we're sort of taking the pressure off of that performance. It's like, did you show up? Uh, did you have um, uh, a thesis? Sometimes I'll do, did you ask a question in the question period and you get a point? Uh, I did that recently and it sort of, <laughs> it, it was a bit of a disaster because basically everybody had their hand up and then I just didn't really have enough points left. Uh, however, it was a beautiful discussion. Um, so, you know, That's just it's just the answer to your question not that I would give is just that you could do pieces, small pieces, you know, select assignments for that instead of trying to sort of convert the whole thing away from graded. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, at that, uh, the yeah, like Morberly said, at that uh, panel we attended and every panel I've attended on ungraded grading, it always does seem to end on the note of we need this to be 
an institutional shift away from uh, current models of grading to allow teachers to try these different ways of approaching these things. So I guess to keep uh, try to make our classes equitable and be mindful of this as possible in the interim, but keep, I guess, uh, pushing for those changes at a higher level as well. Sorry, I saw Heather was in the Thanks. chat and then we have a hand up as well. Oh, Mo really, and um, thank you so much. You answered my question as you were answering Fabricio's. Thank you. Yeah, sort of like the rubric with the points, I think, is, is one way to do that. Yeah, to, to reward the labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a hand up from Dan. That's right. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you there so you much, go, uh, Craig and Mobley. I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. Uh, hi, Mobley. I don't think we've met. I'm the Associate uh, Dean here in the Faculty of Arts at KPU. Um, I, in my own teaching, um, probably like many other instructors, um, I've been experimenting with more um, oral forms of assessment, partly in response mm. to generative AI, but, you know, partly just to expand the toolkit. Um, but one thing I've been doing recently is um, oral examinations, and I found that they've been really valuable. But it struck me that oral examinations are really like a form of spontaneous scholarly speaking, um, whereas many oral assessments are based around prepared scholarly speaking, you know, presentations, speeches, that kind of thing. So I was wondering, in preparing this resource, did you think about, um, do you provide guidelines or resources or advice that would allow students to develop strategies for spontaneous forms of scholarly speaking? Great question. Uh, yeah, ahead, we, we don't insofar as in the, uh, the specific context that you're speaking about, but we do uh, in the context of the Q&A. So that, that's something we've heard a lot from students. I mean, that's kind of when you need to do that unscripted work is when you're, you've, you're like we're doing now, answering questions. And students have told us that it's very terrifying. So there are some resources and some examples that uh, are focused around that and some principles to bring to, uh, per, you know, to those kinds of instances, like taking a pause after you hear the question to collect your thoughts and um, uh, sort of things like that. Um, though I will say that in some of the conversations I've had with folks in giving workshops and talks like this, I've learned that even those kinds of settings are so discipline specific. So I was speaking to someone in uh, doing a PhD in surgical medicine and basically saying that those environments are so cutthroat and so nasty. And how do you respond in those situations? So I think, you know, in some ways we're not covering every every part of those different settings, but there are some principles in the Q&A sections of the site that, that do address that a bit. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to digging through it and seeing what I can learn from it. Thank you so much. Wonderful, okay. thank you. I have a question. I think we've got about two minutes left. No one else is waiting. Um, there's a big movement to create um, legacy assignments where students are doing things on, in assignments that will be used by other people and be helpful to others rather than just being disposed of at the end of the course. And I think this opportunity in the website for these sorts of things is great. If students were going in giving presentations that they knew potentially could be part of a website like this to help future students, I think that would be a very meaningful thing for students to do. So just wondering if there are instructors who would like to set presentation based um, assignments who uh, would like their student assignments to uh, presentations to be considered for your website. Is that a possibility? Absolutely, I would say yeah, that's a, it would be a dream come true. Uh, part of the hardest part about getting the web or building the website was just getting the content uh, and yeah, being able to set up the filming and so on, especially we started during COVID. So we have it's there's some stuff with uh, Zoom meetings and masks on and things like that. Uh, but we managed. Uh, but yeah, if there's uh, are there all, any opportunities for to add more content uh, from different disciplines, different contexts is always really exciting for us. So please let us know. And yeah, I really like that idea of the legacy assignments. Uh, I think just seeing how excited our students were genuinely honored, I think, to be asked to be included on the website. Uh, so that's wonderful. So, yeah, yeah I, I really like that idea. Bye, I just, Heather. 
Oh, I'll just say very quickly that I did do that with this pharmacy class I worked with and the instructor invited students who were interested and we had about three students who ended up presenting on video, which is actually sort of since COVID become a bit easier with, you know, the technologies and the, all the rooms are set up for these sorts of things. So uh, it does take some resources on our end, but we have been doing it and it was a, it was sort of built into this instructor's class that at the end, a few students would get this opportunity and, and, it, and it worked out really well. And we're, we're also would solicit, speaking of legacy, like uh, instructor assignments, like Dale uh, using that video and how you used it in your class. Like we have a, a resources part on the on the uh, instructor resources page that we're looking to build. So, you know, sort of hearing from other people about how they're using the site and having that become part of the site as well would be really, uh, we would love that as well if anyone is interested in getting back to us about how they've used it. Okay, thank you so much, Craig and Moberly, for the wonderful presentation and for the great questions from our audience. Um, if anyone else wants to uh, connect with you afterwards, I presume you're open to that. Um, Absolutely, yeah. I feel like there's probably a lot more discussion we could have if we hadn't sadly ran out of time. Um, thank you again to everyone for coming and thank you for the great presentation. And I hope that uh, at least some of you will be able to come to our next presentation on January 30th, which is also about pedagogy. So maybe we can make some links back to this one. Yeah. Okay, Thank enjoy you. the rest of your day, everyone, and thanks once again to our excellent speakers. Take care. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you.